Hello, everyone. I'm Dave Meinhard. I'm with the Vatacuti Foundation in suburban Detroit, and I welcome you to this Vatacuti Foundation webinar series program, Vascular Access for Hemodialysis. I'm going to go ahead and turn the program over to Dr. Jigas Vias, who is a urologist and recovery surgeon for the Honorbridge Company in North Carolina. Our CEO, Dr. Mahendra Bandari, is traveling to meet with a group of Vatacuti Fellows tomorrow, and he sends his regrets. Without any further ado, let's let Dr. Vias take over the program. Thank you all for being here today. Yeah, so uh, good morning, uh, everybody, and uh, good evening uh, from, uh, to the viewers who are viewing from India. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Dev and Ms. Papa, for helping us for this uh, webinar. And uh, we must express as a team uh, our uh, great uh, gratitude to Dr. Mahendra Bandari, sir, and uh, Particuity Foundation for uh, allowing us uh, uh, to, to allow our expressions on this very august and very prestigious uh, uh, webinar on this platform. So uh, uh, we are today going to discuss about the hemodialysis, uh, going to uh, discuss about the vascular access about the hemodialysis. As we know that the incidence of CKD, which is a chronic kidney disease, is uh, increasing. Uh, and in this slide, we can see that uh, there is a study about the American population, and uh, it is a study between 1996 to 2013. And we can see the incidence of CKD is gradually increasing uh, steeply. Uh, this is because of uh, increased longevity of the population, as well as uh, increased improved quality of life. And there is also increase in comorbidities like diabetes and hypertension. So, uh, so now, now the average people who are coming for dialysis, uh, the average age is uh, nearly 64 in some of the de developing countries. It has been estimated that uh, within two decades, the current prevalence of uh, security, which is uh, 6 to 18% at present, is going to be double. It is also estimated that by the end of 2030, uh, we have more than 9 million people globally who has uh, uh, who has this security? Thus, security is a great burden and a great economical burden on uh, on uh, having uh, global issues. Also, we also know that the best treatment for a security is the kidney transplant. But uh, the demand and supply, the gap between demand and supply is so high that less than 20% patients only uh, are uh, fortunate to have a kidney transplant. Remaining 80% of the patient should be on dialysis. We also know that uh, the dialysis are of two form. It can be peritoneal dialysis or the hemodialysis. The peritoneal dialysis has an advantage of uh, mobility, like patient can have peritoneal dialysis from uh, home or uh, workplace. Uh, uh, but the issues with peritoneal dialysis is infection. It is not as uh, robust as other forms of uh, fistulas. So uh, only less than 20% of the patient globally will opt for uh, dialysis. The remaining 80% of the patient uh, will go for uh, hemodialysis, uh, which can be done acutely with the help of central venous catheterization or chronically with the help of AV fistula or AV graft. So today we are going to discuss about uh, central venous catheterization and AV fistula. Uh, this is uh, central venous catheterization for, for acute dialysis. Uh, the AV fistula for chronic dialysis has been uh, explained in 1966 by Bresica, and many of the principles which they have discussed are still relevant. Uh, the fistula has advantage of uh, uh, doing an easy surgery with less complication. We can cannulate it uh, repeatedly and uh, uh, repeatedly and uh, uh, like uh, it can be refreshed any time. So fistula is most commonly used vascular access throughout the world. And as we see uh, in most of the countries, uh, fistula is the most commonly accessed uh, uh, accessed uh, way for uh, dialysis. So uh, to discuss more about uh, fistula and vascular access, so we have panels of four doctors uh, who have a special interest in this specialty. So before we can start our talk, uh, I want to introduce them very briefly. Uh, we have first uh, speaker, Dr. Abhijit Kunnur, who is a nephrologist and transplant physician at Muljibai Patel Kidney Hospital, uh, Nadiad, India. 
Uh, after finishing his uh, nephrology, he has done his uh, fellowship in nephrology and adult kidney transplant from Toronto, Canada. Uh, and he's talking about uh, indications of hemodialysis and about uh, central venous catheter. Our second uh, speaker is Dr. Muthu, who is our teacher and mentor since years. Uh, Dr. Muthu is a urologist and transplant surgeon, and he works uh, he works at SRM Institute of Medical Sciences, Chennai, in the southern part of India. And he will be talking about uh, vascular access surgery, its principle and evaluation. Uh, our third speaker is Dr. Abhijit Patil, who is also a consultant urologist and transplant surgeon, uh, who is heading the transplant department at uh, MPUH. Uh, he did his uh, MCH from uh, uh, Nair Hospital, Mumbai, and after that, he has done prestigious endurological fellowship from MPUH Nadiad. He's talking about types of fistulas, uh, which type of fistula to be chosen, and how he performs them. I'll ask our and I'll be talking about the complications of fistula as a fourth speaker uh, and how we manage those complications. So I will uh, invite uh, Dr. Abhijit Kunur to give his first talk uh, on uh, on uh, central venous catheterization. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Jigish. Uh, at the outset, let me thank uh, the Vatikuti Foundation and Dr. Vijigish Vas for having me and involving me in this uh, very uh, interesting topic. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, hemodialysis and hemodialysis catheters. Uh, the flow of the talk is going to be about uh, indications of hemodialysis and something about hemodialysis catheters, indications, complications, and management. So hemodialysis indications, the most common and prominent indications is to continue maintenance hemodialysis in patients who are already on dialysis. The other is urgent or emergent indications where they can be metabolic in nature, like electrolytes and acid-base imbalances, uh, increased extracellular fluid volume, also known as hypervolemia or congestive heart failure, signs of uremia, especially pericarditis, encephalopathy, or otherwise unexplained decline in mental status, poisonings, toxins, and some malignancies where hemodialysis is used to remove abnormal products or byproducts of therapy. And finally, but rarely, you could have a, a hemodialysis to modulate body functioning, like patients who have suffered from hypothermia to warm their blood up or osmotic challenges, especially after exposure to high uh, ionic contrasts, one would uh, require patients to be dialyzed. These are the most common uh, indications to uh, administer dialysis to anybody. I would focus everybody's attention on the ones where the black arrows are, and especially patients who are having severe acidosis with a pH of less than 7.15, or who have hyperkalemia with a serum potassium level of more than six milliequivalents per liter and ECG changes. That's very important. Also, patients who have a blood urea nitrogen of more than 100, uh, severe hypermagnesemia of more than 8 milliequivalents per liter, and uh, somebody who has diuretic resistant fluid overload requiring him uh, external ventilatory support. Vascular excess can be of three natures, depending on the time. Uh, acute, which is less than 90 days, usually we use uh, venous catheters as a bridge. That is uh, from 90 days to three years, one could use a tunnel cuff venous catheter or prosthetic AV grafts. Or for somebody who requires uh, vascular access use for more than three years, uh, autogenous AV fistula is the best possible access. Hemodialysis catheters are of uh, the tunneled or the non-tunneled variety. A catheter can be broadly divided into three parts. One is the connectors and the hub part. The second is the body of the catheter. And finally, there is the catheter tip, which lies inside the vessel. So uh, depending on the material, length, 
lumen size, lumen configuration, inlet and outlet holes, and connector extensions, various type of catheters are available in the market. So um, in the catheter characteristics, characteristics catheters uh, material, uh, initially Teflon and polyvinyl was used, but they were found to be very thrombogenic. And hence now for temporary catheters, usually polyurethane is used, uh, although it is stiff and radio opaque. Tunnel catheters typically are made out of silicone or silicone elastomers. Uh, they are quite flexible. They have thick walls and the cuff used in the tunnel catheter is usually made of Dacron. There are newer catheters coming, which are made of carbothane material. Uh, the length and lumen size, very important for a nephrologist. The lumen sizes usually are from nine to 16 French, and the internal diameter is usually anywhere from 0.75 to 2.2 millimeters. The catheter length varies according to its function and to the site where it is inserted. So a right internal jugular vein catheter will be around 15 centimeters in length. A left internal jugular vein catheter will be around 20 centimeters in length. A femoral catheter will be around 20 to 24 centimeters in length. And a tunnel catheter can, especially from the femoral, can be anywhere from 50 to 70 centimeters in length. The catheters uh, typically look like these. These are all the tunnel catheters. Uh, depending on the lumen, uh, one can have the arterial and venous lumens, which are completely separated. They could be partially separated or they could be conjoined. So in the Tessio catheters, you have them completely separated, which you can see on the left upper portion. The uh, other could be uh, a variant of Tessio where it is partially separated. The typical quintance of permacath is uh, the catheter where it's partially separated as two separate lumens jacketed by a common polyurethane. And last is the vascath, which is used commonly now. And there is a double D configuration for the vascath. Tips, the tip of the tunnel catheter can either be stepped or split or at the same level or self-centering. So depending on this, uh, various types of catheters are uh, manufactured. There are a variety, but let me tell you that studies or evidence at this point of time does not give any superiority or non-inferiority to any catheter based on the, uh, the, the uh, tip uh, configuration. Of very, the importance of the catheter is its use for dialysis. So the flow of blood through these catheters is extremely important. We all know flow is increased and is in direct proportion to a four uh, power diameter. Flow is inversely proportional to the length of the catheter. So larger catheters typically give better flow, but they are compromises on the ease of placement and the hydraulic conductance of tunnel catheters are comparable to a 16G AV fistula needle. Uh, blood flow achieved. So the non-tunnel catheters achieve a flow of around 250 ml per minute when the prescribed pump speed is around 300 ml per minute. And it's higher in the right IJV as compared to the left because it has to travel shorter distances. Tunnel catheters uh, have higher blood flow rates than non-tunnel, where you could reach up to 400 ml per minute. And uh, the important thing is the tip of the tunnel catheter has to be in the right atrium. And it's usually wider in lumen. The off note, the actual blood flow rates in catheters are always lower than the prescribed pump flow rates purely because of tubing uh, deformation due to elevated negative pressures in the catheters. Compared to AV fistulas, uh, they require an increase in treatment time of approximately 20% to achieve similar clearance. Hence, AV fistulas are very efficient in dialysis delivery in shorter duration of time. Preferred site of placement, the right internal jugular vein is the preferred site. 
Or one can also use the left internal jugular vein, although when one gets left blood flows and there are chances of catheter malfunction. Uh, we usually avoid subclavians uh, because this can lead to high incidences of central vein stenosis. The tip position typically for non-tunnel catheters is in the superior vena cava and for the tunnel catheter, it is in the right atrium. For the femoral catheter, the tip is usually placed in the internal jugular vein. The shelf life or the use life for this catheter uh, varies by depending on the site of insertion, catheter type and catheter material. But typically the right internal jugglers are used anywhere from two to three weeks. The femoral catheter can be a single use or it can uh, range anywhere from uh, zero to seven days for patients who are bed bound and tunnel catheters can be used from six months and longer depending on the site and the center specific characteristics. Now coming to the important topic of complications related to catheters. So complications can be divided into immediate and late and they may typically be because of catheters or related to the patient. Amongst the catheter-related complication, it can be due to mechanical causes or functional causes. Uh, mechanical causes typically because of uh, kinks, structural damage to the catheters, any position errors as in placement of the tip or uh, the curvature uh, that the catheter needs to attain, luminal thrombosis or presence of stenosis. And functional complications where Everybody, you know, tries to scratch their head saying, hmm, this looks good, but it's still not working and usually takes a long time to fix. Uh, the complication can be patient related. Uh, worst things happening, arrhythmias and cardiac arrest, especially when one uses guide wires or where the catheter touches the uh, hard surface. It can cause uh, pneumothorax and pneumothorax where introducer knees and actually uh, are not supposed to go where they do. Bleeding, hematomas, arterial punctures, air embolism, uh, presence of he hemomediastinum, and injury to the phrenic or recurrent laryngeal nerve. Uh, rarely, and the worst case scenario, cardiac perforations have been seen in some patients. Best way to do it is to do it under ultrasound guidance, as one can see in this cartoon where the carotid is placed quite close to the right and left internal jugular and the vein kind of dances around the carotids. So makes sense in locating the vein appropriately using a uh, sonology guidance. Long-term complications, non-infectious, vessel stenosis is not uncommon in non-tunnel catheters. And this occurs because of vessel wall injury and stenosis uh, because of prolonged tunnel cuff catheter use, especially if the catheter tip is in the superior vena cava or at the junction of the two veins. Uh, subclavian catheters are at exceedingly high risk and nephrologists usually frown when they see anything in the subclavians, then be it uh, hemodialysis catheters or pick lines or even sometimes ports. Catheter dysfunction is classified as early or late. Early catheter dysfunction may be related to uh, insertion technique where there is presence of sharp curves, the tip being in the superior vena cava, or the tip is stuck to the opposite venous wall leading to flow issues. And late causes may be dysfunction and is usually related to catheter thrombosis. Uh, the catheter, catheter thrombosis can be of two types. It can be extrinsic or intrinsic, meaning whether the problem is inside the catheter or it lies outside. Inside the catheter, typically one can have venous thrombosis, mural thrombosis, or arterial thrombosis, meaning the thrombus is present in the catheter. The catheter gets encased in a thrombus in the vein, or it has a big, large arterial thrombus hanging at one end of the catheter. Uh, ex uh, the intrinsic uh, uh, causes are intraluminal uh, catheter tip uh, and presence of fibrin sheath, which I will come to uh, very shortly. 
So extrinsic thrombus is presence of uh, the catheter in vein makes vein predisposed to thrombogenesis. And the incidence is anywhere from two to 63% in different studies. Back pressure changes can occur in the territory of the vein. And uh, this can be uh, required systematic, uh, systemical anticoagulation. Mural thrombosis are typically attached to the wall of the vessel and similar thrombus in the atrium can be large and sometimes life-threatening when it gets dislodged from the catheter and uh, can cause uh, pulmonary embolism. Intraluminal thrombus develops after failure of uh, proper catheter flushing or if the blood remains in the catheter, there's presence of air bubble in the catheter, or if the heparin use uh, is inadequate. Catheter should be flushed with 5,000 units per ml of heparin up to the capacity of the catheter uh, and should not contain any air bubbles. They should be clamped immediately and the caps should be placed. Uh, uh, presence of thrombus actually uh, forces us to use urokinase, cat flow, uh, and uh, thrombolysis, where you have to use around 5,000 units per ml of uh, urokinase to be flushed in both limbs up to the capacity and left there for around 30 minutes and then aspirated. If doesn't work, then again dwell for 30 more minutes. Uh, flush the catheter with similar volumes and then advance the solution by 0.2 ml saline every five minutes. So it's basically a push and pull. And uh, infusion of altoplase can be used uh, for one milligram per hour per lumen for two to four hours if the urokinase cat flow doesn't work. In case of TIF thrombosis, heparin may not be retained in the arterial ports where it leaks out and causes TIF thrombosis. It can be occlusive in nature or can be ball valve in type. Uh, usually it requires a forceful flushing. Although I have had cases where dislodging of the tip catheter has gone and uh, got stuck in the pulmonary artery, causing a lot of heartburn to the patient and to the nephrologist. So I would avoid this. And urokinase locks uh, may help where they, uh, you know, kind of uh, break down the uh, uh, clot itself. Now, fibrin sheath uh, starts at the point of entry of the catheter in the vein and may extend up to the tip, and it's loosely attached to the catheter. Off note, 100% catheters develop fibrin sheath, but most of them are not problematic. The start of the fibrin sheath can start anywhere at 48 hours. The sheath at the tip is usually disrupted by inflowing blood or saline, but sometimes it can fall uh, a ball wall or a flap like mechanism where the return is easy but the suction out of the catheter becomes difficult unfortunately because it's a mechanical problem urokinase uh, locking doesn't solve the problem people have used it over time at increased doses but doesn't work many times usually it requires catheter stripping that is uh, uh, you know kind of um, uh, introducing a snare from the femoral vein and then going and stripping the catheter of the uh, fibrin sheath. Uh, it may also entail changing the catheter over guide wire, which is probably the easiest thing to do. Um, sometimes one you know, takes the catheter out, does a angiographic balloon disruption of the fibrin sheath and then reintroduces the catheter over a guide wire. Uh, but there is no prophylactic regimen which may avoid this problem. Uh, this cartoon actually tells us one of the most important complications of catheter is catheter-related uh, bloodstream infections, which are all of us dread. On the left upper side, we can see that there is presence of a biofilm, which is required for uh, the presence of a CRBSI. And on this biofilm is where the bugs come in and uh, they start camping there, colonize, and finally become infective and may also metastasize from this area. Um, uh, the entry points for the CRBSIs are typically can uh, be uh, through the catheter, which is seen in the right lower cartoon. Uh, it can, uh, they can also traverse along the catheter wall uh, uh, as, as, as endogenous skin flora or because of uh, contaminated disinfectants. 
Sometimes contaminated catheter hubs may be the uh, culprit uh, the reasons why people develop CRBSI. Um, I'm going to dwell a little bit on this slide and purely because this is probably the most important slide in this whole presentation. How do you uh, diagnose a CRBSIs and what is the appropriate therapy? So clinical features, uh, two out of three uh, should be present. Fever, which is more than 38 degrees centigrade before dialysis or uh, more than 37.7 degrees centigrade during dialysis. We all know uh, dialysis warms up the blood a bit. At the same time, patients have uh, clinical features of chills, rigors, presence of hypotension, or there is some alternative uh, unexplained malaise or uh, absent alternative side of infections, but patients are febrile. Uh, we, uh, the diagnosis of CRBSI is uh, made by microbiology. So at least one blood culture positive from a peripheral source, either the dialysis catheter or vein, and there's no other apparent source with the quantitative uh, presence of at least uh, 15 uh, colony forming units per catheter segment hub or tip, or a quantitative of 10 raised to two colony forming units per catheter segment tip or hub, uh, presence of organism of the same species isolated from the catheter segment or a peripheral smear nearly you know, nails the diagnosis of CRBSI of uh, supportive uh, 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 availability would be, you know, quantification and showing that there is more than three to one ratio uh, of uh, the organism at the catheter tip to getting it in the peripheral blood. And also its persistence, uh, that is uh, two blood cultures uh, separated by two hours. All these, you know, kind of nearly nailed the diagnosis of CRBSI. There are three main types of catheter-related infections, uh, typically exit infections, uh, tunnel infections, and uh, bloodstream infections, that is bacteremia or uh, uh, soft tissue infections because of metastasis from this. Now, prevention is better than cure. We all know this. So methods to prevent CRBSI, extra luminal strategies would be to take appropriate hub care, meaning you know, wash the hub with chlorhexidine, uh, exit site care, wash it with normal saline or tea backed or some antibiotic ointment, skin care, making sure that there's no uh, infected uh, lesions or folliculitis around the insertion site or exit site, connection, follow disconnection protocols in the dialysis unit, intraluminal strategies uh, using antibiotic locks, antimicrobial locks. Uh, using connectors. Uh, most important is a multidisciplinary team approach and the presence of a dedicated vascular access nurse or coordinator goes a long, long way in prevention of CRBSI. A very busy uh, slide. Actually, this is the holy grail of treatment of CRBSI. I basically want to draw everybody's attention to three stages. One is nailing the diagnosis, which we actually uh, discussed in the previous slide, getting positive blood cultures. Number two is the kind of organisms that one is dealing with, because some of them uh, may require uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, no salvage of catheter, taking it off, especially Staphylococcus aureus, fungal infections, and uh, Pseudomonas, where one would actually be forced to remove the catheter itself and then treat patients. Uh, management of CRBSI, uh, two strategies otherwise. One is removing the central venous catheter, and second is retaining the central venous catheter. Removing the central venous can catheter can either be a venous catheter exchange over a guide wire uh, using the same exit site, or it could be removing the central venous catheter and reintroduction in a different site. Retaining the central venous catheter typically involves using either antibiotic locks in the catheter or systemic antibiotic uh, usage. Of note, removing the central venous catheters 
a uh, non tunneled central venous catheter should always be removed in case of crbsi uh, tunnel catheters uh, may be removed in the following situation this is commonly the question that is in everybody's mind so i want to dwell on this one is blood cultures growing staphylococcus aureus or staphylococcus lugdunensis presence of klebsiella mycobacteria pseudomonas or fungal infections organisms like candida uh, if there is any presence of complications like septic thrombosis septic shock endocarditis or osteomyelitis i cannot overemphasize that if one gets a patient who is hypotensive and you are suspecting crbsi salvaging the catheter does not work one will not be able to salvage the patient so underline hypotension need of inotropes don't think twice remove the catheter uh, the, if there is presence of coexisting tunnel infection or abscesses uh, positive persistent blood cultures uh, 72 hours after therapy telling you that either the it's a multi drug resistant organism or one uh, the one is simply overwhelmed with the infection of the catheter at the time of uh, central venous catheter removal uh one should evaluate for the presence of fibrin sheath and fibrin sheath di di uh, disruption may be required there are four major approaches for treatment of crbsi one is definitive treatment of crbsi crbsi generally requires systemic antibiotics along with uh, central venous catheter removal however it can lead to uh, venous stenosis and loss of precious access site bringing us to the other strategies systemic antibiotics alone uh, is uh, inadequate with a success rate of around 30% only uh, we do sometimes try this out and we get the result in the first 72 hours because if the patient is not improving uh, doesn't make sense you just have to remove the catheter immediate catheter removal plus catheter replacement using a guide wire to change the catheter has a success rate of around 80% in different studies so this probably is a more a credible option and use of antibiotic or antiseptic locks along with the strategy alluded to earlier may increase the success rate by 5 to 10% and may uh, prevent uh we, we go in terms of catheter salvage for some of our patients so to conclude a uh, catheter should be used as a bridge to av fistulas or a transplantation fistula first initiative for patients with chronic kidney disease is the way to go ahead adequate and timely dialysis saves life so referring nephrology services early can't be over emphasized uh thank you all for a patient uh, listening and i hand this over to dr jigish vyas to uh, conduct the uh, series again thank you once again uh, thank you dr konur for your <clears throat> lucid talk uh, you pointed out the very pertinent uh, points uh, my question for you is uh, your uh, guidelines and your uh, way of management differs in pediatric patients like if they come with uh, acute kidney injury pediatric patients uh, you do anything different from what you do for adults that's a good question so uh, broadly the uh, access can be a difficult uh, situation for pediatric uh, services uh, most important is whether the material is available and the manpower is available to deal with them many of our rural hospitals or the semi urban uh, hospitals may not be able to match up to this we are a quaternary care center so usually what we do is we treat them just the way we do with adults but only thing is the material required is different the size of the catheters we have them ready so that goes a long way another uh, strategy is to use peritoneal dialysis in some of the pediatric patients where uh, for them probably a long term access could be a pediatric pd catheter as compared to a hemodialysis catheter one has to take into account that school uh, schools are important one doesn't want to interfere with their quality of life so uh, you know as a bridge to transplant 
probably a PD may also be an equally uh, efficacious method to uh, deliver dialysis. Uh, thank you, Dr. Konur. Uh, now I'll ask our second speaker, Dr. Muthu, uh, to deliver his talk, please. I would like to thank uh, uh, Bhattikuri Foundation and uh, Dr. Jigis Vyas for considering me for this talk. And uh, greetings from Chennai and good evening to everyone. My talk today is about uh, the basic principle and uh, how I am going to evaluate a patient referred to me for a vascular access surgery. So uh, Dr. Jigis had spoken about the burden of uh, CKD as well as um, Dr. Abhijit had given a brief idea about the indication for dialysis and uh, catheter and its problems. So the treatment option is uh, uh, obvious and I, I will be briefing about uh, AB fistula that uh, uh, the patients uh, the, who are on CKD need dialysis. Uh, however, the patients uh, who are on dialysis, their longevity is directly proportional to the quality of dialysis. In turn, the quality of dialysis depends upon the reliability as well as the integrity of the patient's vascular uh, system. The connecting point is vascular access, okay? So the ideal vascular access uh, is the uh, one that provides a reliable uh, complication-free access uh, for a particular patient tailored to the uh, patient needs. Considering all these vascular access methods, uh, the uh, it is a lifeline for the ESRD patient. Autologous AB fistula is uh, uh, less susceptible for failure, and there is a decreased uh, uh, intervention for like infection, bleeding, and thrombosis. And a successful fistula should have a good continuous thrill, and you should be able to use the uh, uh, earliest, and it should have a good outflow. As per the uh, KD OQI guideline, when the fistula is matured, it should be able to use within six weeks from the uh, maturation, and you should be uh, it should be six millimeter below the surface, and you should have a, a six millimeter diameter where, where the technician can able to cannulate it, and uh, and 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 it put be able to produce a six hundred ml of uh, uh, blood in the machine that can use it. Um, the basic requirement uh, for a preoperative, like the basic principle is that the vascular access surgeon should go to the dialysis. Uh, ward and uh, have a, a discussion with the nephrologist and the technician how they are going to and the basic requirements are you need microsurgical instruments always the magnification is better and you should be handling the tissues meticulously and you should have a meditated mind though it is a uh, surgery is a symbol but it is a highly skilled surgery. And the treating surgeon should know what happened after crystal creation. That is what very, very important. There is a rapid increase in blood flow across the vein. Our aim is to arterialize the vein where we can uh, puncture it. And, uh, and that is immediately after dilated, uh, uh, release of the clamp. Uh, I'm not going into the technical issue, but Dr. Abhijit is going to talk about that. And uh, there is acute dilatation of both artery and vein. And there is a uh, wall shear stress on the veins that will produce or because of the blood flow. And the vessel luminal diameter is increased. Ultimately, there is an arterialization of the vein. This chart shows about how the normal vein get, uh, it looks like that after the anastomosis. Whereas in a, uh, in a CKD patient, there is, there is always, there is a, intimal damage or this thing, there is a turbulence in the blood flow, will end up in a, and the, the, the wall shear stress on the vein that will produce intimal hyperplasia, we end up in failures. Uh, th this is what, what the normal vein, how will I feel that? Whereas the patients with the CKD 
and the wall will get the intimal hyperplasia that is more prone for uh, failure. And coming on to the evaluation and uh, proper history is very, very important because and uh, that, that is what how uh, we are going to take the uh, site of surgery and uh, and uh, the clinical examination is very, very important and we may need some relev uh, relevant investigation before taking up for vascular access. No thoracic surgery or any intervention, um, the neck or a trauma neck, uh, and if there is any comorbidities or um, previous vascular access, there are any drugs like anticoagulants. And clinical examination involves um, examination of the vein, examination of the artery, and uh, look for, uh, usually always look for the non-dominant hand. It should be, the patient should be examined in a very good light, ambience, good uh, lying posture, and uh, the arm size has to be uh, compared with the opposite side. Uh, look for is there any collateral veins, and the veins, uh, the veins should be examined with a tonic A, and we should be able to feel the tap. The, if you tap the uh, distal end, we should be able to feel the tap, the thrill, and the that is, shows the, how the vein is there. The next part is the examination of arterial system. And you should uh, uh, feel the pulse of the artery, the peripheral pulses. And another way to do that, the, what we taught in the anatomy, the Allen's test, where to know the uh, um, uh, Pama arch, where the, when we are going to use the radial artery, uh, the, 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 the post there is a, uh, distal flow is compromised, something like a steel syndrome, and uh, the blood pressure of the both upper limbs should be measured. And uh, the patient should be examined thoroughly. We look for is there any congestive cardiac failure, mainly because if you uh, after, immediately after releasing the clamp, there will be a lot of blood pumped into the heart, and that cause CCF may get aggravated. Imaging uh, is um, very uh, like the mapping, vascular mapping, um, usually done with um, duplex uh, uh, Doppler ultrasonography is a method of choice. Sometimes if the, you know, there is very some patients where the veins are not able to see, where uh, we may get, go for a digital subtraction venography or venography and when it will be limited use. The indications for um, uh, uh, the Doppler ultrasound is like uh, obese patients where elderly female with the comorbidities and uh, peripheral vascular disease or coronary artery disease where clinically we are not able to uh, examine properly and uh, other like if they are suspecting any central venous stenosis and and, and uh, like something like I've been, there are limitations for the physical examination. We are not able to uh, uh, map the vein and then, then there, there is an indication for uh, Doppler study. And uh, the, I would like to expect Dorongi uh, from the radiologist. He should mention about, uh, he should draw about the veins like cephalic vein, basilic vein, and its diameter. Is there any thrombus? And uh, this, this is what we, we get it from our radiologist when we do a Doppler there. And um, so the radiologist should mention about um, the diameter of the uh, vein and the artery. And the basic minimum requirement is less than uh, two millimeter and more than two millimeter for the artery, 2.5 millimeter for the vein. And there are uh, evidences uh, support that if the vein diameter is less and there are more chances of uh, primary uh, failure. And uh, for if you are going for a graft, maybe graft, then, then the vein diameter should be more than four millimeter and uh, that will give a good outcome. Um, what the guideline says, it is like there are randomized um, trials available uh, um, in the literature suggests that, uh, but, but um, routine vascular mapping, there are uh, 
it is like like it's a conditional recommendation with a low quality of evidence like expert opinion so it is not recorded uh, needed for almost all the patients it is indicated for special situations the main problem with the uh, doppler uh, uh, ultrasound image is it's operator oriented and uh, one of the main uh, important factor of the distensibility of the vein that cannot be uh, detected by the uh, doppler study Uh, sometimes uh, it will have an inconvenience for the patient, higher cost involvement, and that also delays the uh, uh, system dating. So once the conduit is selected, once uh, examined, and um, you have selected a vein and put a marker over that particular hand, uh, not to inject or uh, you know, protect the vein from the puncture or trauma. so some of the location i am not going in detail into the technical aspect because dr abhijit is going to cover it in and uh, uh, normally you should know the anatomy of the uh, venous anatomy of the hand and usually we will have to start uh, from the distal aspect like start from the anatomical snuff box the, the wrist then goes to the elbow and usually use the Uh, superficial veins and keep the deep veins for the uh, if there is multiple failures and the commonest fistula is the brisios uh, you know fistula it is in the wrist and sometimes you can either you can do a end to side which is a more common and it done rather than side to side the side to side associated with the more venous hypertension and the brachial you can do it with uh, Uh, brachiocephalic like um, the brachial artery or the median pubital vein is anastomous to the uh, the thing sometimes you can put a loop crab or uh, i will show you a small video about um, uh, non touch technique when you do a ab fistula uh, you can clearly watch that i am not going to touch that is what very very important when you do a fistula um, and without touching the artery and the vein and you should be able to retract and do a uh, then only the outcome will be uh, better and meticulous tissue handling magnification as i said earlier and if you have a microscope that is better and ultimately we need to have a outcome that the way that that is a lifeline for the patients who are on suffering from ckd so don't touch the intima and try to hold and once you release that clamp it should have a good thrill and that will be the outcome and should be able to use it after 6 weeks and we should be in informing the patient about how to take care of the fistula and and inform them about they 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 said like a team work like like a early referral from the nephrologist it should be the fistula has to be done at least in the ckd stage 4 at least 3 months before and uh, involve the patient educate about the patient that should be a, as uh, dr abhijit kunor said about the vascular access coordinator and the involvement of it's so like a teamwork you know nephrologist uh, patient technician and the patient himself has to know what we are going to do that and ultimately the message is though it looks simple but it's a highly skilled surgery that is a lifeline for the Uh, CKD patients and uh, needs a uh, uh, renal replacement. Thank you so much for your patient hearing, and once again I thank Dr. Jigis for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, sir, for your uh, nice talk. Uh, I have a question for you. Like uh, you mentioned that uh, venous distension, like vein, should be more than two point five mm. But some, but sometimes this is a uh, like a falsely dilated vein. Sometimes there is a stenosis. 
so when during the surgery uh, if you find that there is a venous stenosis though the saline is going very nicely but you could not pass a five french infant feeding tube what you do at that time what is your plan of action at that time actually what i used to do i used to dissect the vein check its patency before dissecting the artery so once i found that there is a stenosis if it is not uh, able to cannulate right? like like what i used to do i when i do i, I do a gentle flushing with the saline saline and if i could able to feel the thrill then that means that um, the vein is patent and i don't put some uh, like a feeding tube to it may traumatize the uh, this thing if it is a stenosis i don't go ahead with the uh, fistula i will stop it i will go further higher up thank you sir for your uh, nice talk uh, now i'll introduce our third speaker dr patil who will speak about uh, how and uh, when to choose which type of fistula dr patil please i would like to thank vertipoti foundation for this opportunity and i would also like to thank dr gt shrasa for this uh, wonderful opportunity so uh, the talk today is types of fistula which to choose and how to perform so this would be a more of a technical talk of how to choose uh, basically this has been covered by the previous talk let us first understand what is an ideal fistula it should be easy to construct and maintain it should give adequate blood flow for dialysis it should be easy to cannulate it should allow rotation of cannulation sites because once you create a fistula it is lifeline for the ckd patient and you want that fistula to work for long and now what happens is the patient is on hemo intense hemodialysis thighs of week uh, you need to change or rotate your cannulation sites in your vein so that you don't land up in aneurysm or weakening at that area so uh, your fistula should have adequate space for rotation of cannulation sites it should last long it should be comfortable for the patient and should be free of complications now uh, muthu sir already told you about what is rule of 6 the flow should be more than 600 ml per minute the vein matured vein that you assess after 6 weeks should be greater than 6 mm in diameter and should be less than 6 mm deep from the skin surface that it should be uh, superficial that so that the technician can cannulate it and you should have a 6 cm straight vein of uh, for cannulation now let us first understand uh, the anatomy of the venous and arterial system so that we understand that types of fistula very well now first see the arterial system is that is the brachial artery which divides into a radial artery and a ulnar artery which has a palmar arch okay now the venous system is divided into a deep venous system and a superficial venous system the deep venous system is radial vein ulnar vein which accompany the artery and finally they form a brachial vein the superficial system is the cephalic vein and which continues from the forearm into the arm and you have a basilic system which is medially which again continues from forearm into the arm now what happens is that this basilic system the basilic vein joins the deep system and forms an axillary vein and which continues as subclavian vein while the cephalic vein finally drains into axillary or a superficial or a subclavian vein now understanding this our fistula should always be created with a superficial vein so that we leave down the deep venous system for the drainage of the upper limb now if we do a distal radio cephalic fistula it is between this artery and this vein if we do a brachio cephalic fistula it is between this cephalic vein or a median cubital vein with the brachial artery uh, if this is not working then what we can do is a forearm transposition what it is is that this is the basal vein we would transpose it from this to a lateral area and then anastomose it with the radial artery if you want to do a transposition in the arm it would be we superficialize this brachial uh, the basilic vein we transpose uh, transpose it uh, laterally and then anastomose it with the brachial artery so we can have an rc fistula we can have a bc fistula we can have a forearm transposition or we can have a arm uh, transposition or a basilic vein transposition so this is what i was telling that this is a distal radiocephalic fistula 
this is a, a wrist fistula uh, this is an elbow fistula which is an bc fistula or this is a basalic vein which has transposed and anastomosis with the brachial artery so these are the three most commonly performed upper limb fistulas now what happens if you have a failed rc or a bc fistula is uh, the as a rule you use a non dominant hand the distal rc fistula then you do a bc fistula before going to a bc fistula you can do a proximal rc fistula if possible then you go over a bc fistula if not working you can use your forearm sacralic vein transposition or basalic vein transposition you can do a brachial basalic transposition i have shown you uh, you can anastomose your brachial artery with a axillary vein with a condu which could be autologous like a saphenous vein or it could be a prosthetic graft which uh, connects with your brachial artery to axillary vein and in very rare cases you require something known as lower limb class which could be either graft or it's an autologous vein. Now these are the rare uh, the grafts that you do if you are not AV fistula or autologous AV fistula are not working. Now, which to choose is it can be divided into the side and the location. Uh, for location, it is always from a non-dominant non hand from a distal to a proximal fistula. This is by rule. And uh, side, how do you decide a side is that we generally do a fistula on a non-dominant hand because the patient undergoes dialysis session of around four to five hours, three times a week. So the patient lies down comfortable with the fistula on a non-dominant hand with the uh, veins cannulated for dialysis and the patient can use his uh, dominant hand for recreational purpose like using his mobile or reading a book. And uh, also if there are central venous catheters, if there are long standing central venous catheters, what will happen is that draining central veins would be stenosed and what will happen is that your fistula will not mature because your outflow is obstructed or you will get your fistulas again and again as a clotted fistulas. A peripheral vascular disease. What happens is the, the patient are CKD with diabetes for a long time. What happens is the quality of the arteries deteriorate. They are atherosclerosis. They have calcification. The lumen is less. And what happens if you are doing and uh, suppose an RC fistula in a peripheral vascular disease patient, if you take a suture with a 6 0 then you would just cut through, through this brittle artery and then you will end up in a problem. So, uh, previous uh, arteriograph was CABG. So, this was a patient for whom I had to do an fistula. And when I saw his upper limbs, so this is his left radial artery, and this is your right radial artery, which has been harvested for his CABG. Now, an RC fistula is not doable. Uh, so, you do a proximal fistula in such a patient. Now, what, uh, how to do a fistula? There are certain things that you do for a fistula, is the first and most important thing is a surgical loop. You can use it from 2.5x, 3x, or 3.5x. This would be the maximum that you require for doing a fistula. This is a general a surgical tray that you would require while doing a fistula. Uh, so what you have is you have an internal feeding tube, you have an intracat, you have an hyperice line, you have vascular slings. Uh, vein uh, can be you uh, the blue one can be used for venous, and the right can be a red one can be used for arterial sling and you have a basic open instrument. What I would like to show you is the specific instrument for AV fistula is that you require a 15 number knife for a skin incision. You require an 11 number knife for an arteriotomy. These are your tooth adsense and a plain adsense for handling the tissue. These are your tractors. These are your microsurgical instruments. This is your pot scissors. This is your ring forceps for delicate handling of the vessels. This is a Castro Viejo needle holder or a rider needle holder, whichever you are comfortable with. You have your bulldogs. Uh, the most important instruments for and for the success of your outcome is you should have a very good microsurgical instrument because if this uh, bulldogs uh, injure your arteries, which are delicate, what will happen is that you may land up in a problem subsequently. And this is a pattern if you want for a dilatation of your vessels. Now, there are certain vascular principles. I would just like to reiterate what uh, and re emphasize what Mutusar had actually told is use a vascular forceps so that there is minimal handling and a delicate handling of the vessels. Do not hold the vessel tightly, just support the vessel wall or just give a counter traction so that you can pass the needle through it. There should be minimal intimal handling. 
you can use a parachute technique or a close technique. I would show both of them. The benefit of a parachute mill is uh, that is generally done by SVTS people is that you can see the intimate all the time, but whichever suits you, you do it uh, uh, till you have a good outcome. The direction of the suture is the most important thing. It should always be into out of an artery, just because if you do it from outside to in of an artery, if by chance you have taken only external, what will happen? So an artery has an intima, media, and an external. If you just take an external and uh, suture it with your pain, when you declamp, the blood will seep into some intimal plane and would occlude the lumen. So it should always be in out of your artery. So you take all the three layers of an artery and that is how you don't cause this sub-intimal dissection. And all this uh, suture that you take should be perpendicular to your vessels and they should be evenly placed. And the final thing is that the edges of your vessel should be inverted. They should never be inverted because inversion of vessel walls may lead to thrombosis of the fistula. Now, uh, I would like to show you the three most common fistulas which are done is a distal radiocephalic fistula, then something about the proximal BC fistula, and then something about the brachiovasalic transposition. So I have slightly increased the speed of this fistula uh, procedure so the, for the want of time. This is the artery and vein which I have marked. A point to be noted is that I would always like to take an incision over the artery because the vein can come towards the artery but artery will not go towards your vein. And once you take an incision, uh, if you know a proper plane, so by the time you'll understand if you go into just a proper subcutaneous plane, in no time will you see uh, your cephalic vein. So your pre-op pre mapping is very important. Now a point to be noted is I have handled the artery just minimally and as much as it is required. So I will sling at the two places where I would like to put my bulldog uh, as it has been shown that I will just put an IFT. I would like to flush it. I would check the back flow of the vein and uh, because I would slightly keep my IFT for some time uh, why? Because I don't want handling of my vessel. And a point to be noted here is that uh, if you can see over here, I have used a 11 number knife. Point to be noted is that never poke your knife, 11 number knife, 90 degree to your vessel. It will injure your posterior wall. And if you have injured a posterior wall, it is very difficult to manage. So you always hold your 11 number knife parallel to your blood vessel and then. You do an arterotomy just sufficient so that you can do, uh, uh, you can in, uh, in, increase your incision using a uh, pot scissor. And now, these are the sutures. We, I will show you the suturing. See, all the principles of the vascular principles are followed. I am not touching the vessels. I am out to in of my vein and into out of my arteries. You can very well see all these sutures are perpendicular to the vessels. They are evenly placed and at no point of time I would handle the intima of this vessel. If you can see the assistant is just holding the outer layer of the vessel. The other important thing for a radiocephalic fistula are the angle. So if you take your angles, if you don't take your angle seriously, there could be two problems. One, if you can, if you take your posterior wall, they will never work. And if there is a minor leak at your angle, and if you try to repair it afterwards, what will happen is that these are very small fistulas. What will happen? You will take the posterior wall and try to injure your uh, uh, outflow or inflow. The other thing is that to be noted is the suture material that we use is it is my personal preference to use a 7-0 proline 9 mm needle in all fistulas. But if you are not used to use a 7-0 proline, you can still use a 6-0 proline. And I would urge all your vascular surgeon or urologist who would be doing the fistula is to have a practice of forehand and backhand both ways so that you always follow the vascular principle. You can always hold your vessel on the outer layer and not try to injure your intima. And 
So other point to be noted is that though I am near the angle, I would never try to sink or tighten my suture so that I see my intimas all the time. I would flush my vessel with an hypernized saline. I know my leaks. And once I declam, the you can see a very well fistula which is working well. The vein is distended, there is no bleeding. And this is how we can do your fistula with just a three centimeter incision. Now, this is the brachiocephalic fistula. Here, the artery, brachial artery is marked. This is the cephalic vein which is marked. This is a slightly uh, bigger incision. A point to be noted is that fistulas can be done under two types of anesthesia. The first being a local anesthesia and second being the block. The benefit of the block with a brachial block is that if the vessels are marginal, they would dilate the vessels after the block and at least a 30% increase in the size of the vessels, which would actually make a surgery simpler and may help you to improve the outcome. But if your vessels are of good caliber, then you can do your fistulas under local anesthesia. It can be just a day care procedure. So I'm infiltrating it along the suture line, an incision line. Now I would take an incision. Mm. I would deepen it and as you see, if my preoperative evaluation is perfect, in no time, I would directly be over the vein. So you see, you can clearly see the cephalic vein and this is just at the point where I have marked it by doing an preoperative Doppler myself. And now there are two things that to be noted is that uh, if I am very much uh, pretty happy with my vein in my preoperative evaluation, then I would directly go ahead with the dissection of my artery. I will not fiddle much with my vein. But if not, if I am not happy with my vein in the preoperative evaluation, I would always dissect the vein, cut it, see how uh, the uh, blood flow or how the uh, fluid grows in the distensibility of the vein. And then only I would embark on dissection of the artery. So this is a point to be noted is that never embark on arterial dissection till you are happy with the vein. A point to be noted is that the veins are always superficial to the fascia and the arteries are always deep to the fascia and especially the artery, uh, brachial artery is deep. Point to be noted is that these are the vena comitants or the deep vein which is bra uh, the brachial vein should never try to injure them. They are not vestigial organs. If you try to injure them or bust them or tie them off, what will happen is that it will hamper the venous outflow of your upper limb. Again, I have dissected the vein just which is required, the artery which is required. I am not handling the vein. I am just dissecting off the surrounding tissue of the vein. Now, finally, when I'm ready with my uh, setup, I will slim the vein. The other thing is that in brachiocephalic fistula, the veins are generally laterally and the arteries are medially. So you need to dissect the vein properly so that there is no tension over the anastomosis. There is no kink over the vein. And that is why you should slightly dissect your vein more than your RC fistula. You should have an adequate length of your vein. You may sacrifice some segment of your vein if need be, but it is very difficult that you cut your vein short and then you are in difficult. Then, then what you have to do is your you have to do your anastomosis slightly proximal on your artery. At this point of time, I would cannulate it with an infant feeding tube just to see how is it going on easily and whether. Uh, it is distending well. So, if there is like spasm in your vein, you can just dilate it vein this way. The other benefit of keeping IFT for some time is that it allows me not to handle the vessel. But I also agree that uh, it may injure the intima as uh, told by Mutuzar. So, once the job of the IFT is done, I will just remove it. Now I would apply the bulldogs on both proximal and distal end of my artery which is required. Again the same principle, 
Here, I would like to keep the slings because the vagal artery is deep. I would generally not keep these vascular slings when I'm doing an RC fistula. Just because the artery, uh, radial artery is very delicate and it may go into spasm. And this is how you can do a BC fistula. Again, all the principle of the uh, surgical principle are being followed. The vein is out to in, artery is going to out, there is no handling of vessel, and the uh, sutures are 80, 90 degree or perpendicular to the edges. The edges are everted, and uh, uh, you can uh, finally, what I'll do is again, I'll inject with hypernite saline. Just before the last stage, I would inject with hypernite saline so that there are two things is that the last suture I can take it under vision or I will not take the posterior wall and I know about the vascular anastomosis. So this last stage, it helps me to take the last stage which is slightly in line with me. I generally take six or seven knots for a seven zero choline. Should always remove a distal uh, bulldog and then a proximal bulldog, or you can remove both the bulldogs at the same time if you are pretty confident of your anastomosis. And this is how the final thing to be noted is if there are slight kinks at this point, you should always release them so that they don't snow at that point. And finally, you can close the fistula as well. Now, this is a forearm uh, basal ligament transposition. This is a basal ligament which is medially, you have uh, dissected it off. Now, you remove it from, so this you can do by multiple small incisions. This is how you transpose it laterally. The point to be noted is that once this vein has come out, you should always look for small leaks. Because if there are small branches which would leak, but once it has uh, gone through the tunnel and if it leaks, then it is very difficult to control such bleeding. Now we are dissecting the radial artery. Now the way of uh, tunneling, there are various ways of tunneling is that this is a romoid drain introducer. So what we do is that with, at this point, we, uh, we tie the vein at, to this introducer and then that introducer just comes this way and it brings the vein here. And now you can see we have speculated the vein and we are anastomosing with the radial artery. Uh, if you are, or if there is a last resort is to use a graft, there are various configurations that you can use an upper limb graft is with your radial arteries and your cephalic veins. It could be a loop graft or it could be a graft which is with your, um, obviously your brachial vein and your arteries or it could be a loop uh, uh, graft between your axillary vein and your axillary artery. The last video that I will be showing is a brachial uh, basalic vein transposition is that uh, this could be done in two uh, stages. Uh, in the first stage, you may anastomose your basalic vein with your brachial artery and then it matures and then you do a second stage of transposition at the second stage or you can do it as a primary single stage. This is the basalic vein that I marked. So a point to be noted is that this is the basalic vein. Now there are two ways I can take a long incision this way or I can take a small three incision that I have marked so, and then I can dissect off this vein. So I will show you dissecting of this basalic vein by multiple incisions. You take your incision. Now this is a second stage of basalic vein transposition. This is the point of your anastomosis with your brachial artery. I would disconnect the basalic vein over here. I would tie two sutures over here because the flow is quite high over here. 
disconnect the arterialized vein. As you can see, now the quality of uh, vein is very good. Now, slowly I keep on dissecting the surrounding tissue by taking care that I don't injure the small branches of this vein. And slowly by this uh, dissecting between these two incisions, I will slowly pass off my vein sequentially from distal to proximal incision. I would rather not dissect of this vein just near to its vessel wall. I would keep some tissue around the vein. A point to be noted is that see, if you can see a small vein branch, you should always ligate it off. And this is my point where it would curve here. Now, the two important thing is, sorry. So the two important thing are, so I come to know uh, whether there are leaks in my vein before I embark on tunneling. And second is that I should not twist my vein in the tunnel. So the way that I do is I insert my infant feeding tube, I pinch the proximal end and I would hydro distant and see whether there are any leaks. Now I, at this point of time when I know my vein is very well dissected, there are no leaks, I would now dissect the brachial artery. Now for second stage, I would dissect off this brachial artery slightly proximal to the uh, this, uh, this previous anastomosis. Now this is an important point is that I would use a methylene blue or a marker and mark my vein on the lateral or medial side, whichever works for you. And this is just for your orientation so that the vein does not get kinked in your tract. So this is very important. Now, this is another way of creating a tunnel is a long artery forceps or an aortic clamp that you create a just a subcutaneous tunnel. It should be just subcutaneous as you can see so that the vein is accessible. And I just hold this vein and bring it over here. And now just cut the extra vein that I have. I dissect off the surrounding tissue now. I spatulate my vein and what I would be showing in this case would be a parachute technique. Now, generally I do exercise, uh, this is to create a punch effect. Uh, this is generally done in a bigger artery like a brachial artery. Now you see, I am not cinching. I initially have taken my sutures and I have cinched once I have taken the angle. You can still do uh, the rest part of it, but I generally like to do a hemicircle with uh, uh, that technique and then finish off the other uh, technique. Now, as you can see, the anastomy is straightened, there is no bleeding and this is the superficial vein, which is very much dilated and almost ready for cannulation. And see, this is a final picture with small multiple incision. You can very well create a brachial uh, vein transposition. Well, thank you for the patient listening, and I hope I have covered the, all the basic fistulas and how to do it and tips and tricks so that you can start your fistulas or if those who are doing a fistulas, you can improve the outcome of your fistula. Thank you, Dr. Abhijit. It was a nice demonstration, uh, and the videos were really good. Uh, now uh, we'll go to the fourth presentation maturation failure and other complications of fistula. Uh, we know that uh, fistula is the uh, very prevalent uh, mode of vascular access, but it has its own limitation. Uh, if we check uh, the patency rate, the success rate, uh, which is from the access creation to the first intervention, which is called as a primary patency rate, uh, this is a 55% for the distal fistulas, RC fistulas, whereas for proximal fistula, 
fistulas, it is nearly 52 to 55 percentage. And if we see the secondary patency, overall patency, which starts from excess creation to the abandonment of the fistula, it is 71% for the uh, distal fistula, and it is uh, 74 and 55% for the proximal fistulas. So at the end of three years, the proximal fistulas uh, will be functioning in 70% of the cases. Whereas uh, for the distal fistula, there is a high chance of uh, fistula failure or maturation failure, and almost one quarter of the fistula will not be used at the end of one year. If we see the complications uh, of all the three modalities, the highest complications are with AV graft and lowest with the AV fistula. And among the AV fistula, the most common complication is thrombosis and stenosis. And uh, with uh, CVC, the most common complication is infection. Uh, now, what is maturation of fistula? The maturation period is defined as creation of fistula and the first cannulation. So here we have created the fistula and at some point of time, we are going to cannulate the vein for the first dialysis and it is called as the maturation time, which varies from one to three months. And the factors, as our previous speakers have mentioned, there are various factors which are responsible for the good maturation. They are non-modifiable and modifiable factors. In non-modifiable factors, uh, most important is the vessel-specific uh, factor in which the diameter uh, of the vessels is very important, say 2.5 centimeters for the vein and 2.5 millimeter, uh, millimeter for the vein and 2 millimeter for the artery uh, is sufficient. Good length, distensibility, and blood flow is also very important. In uh, patient-specific factors, uh, female gender, advanced age, comorbidities like diabetes and heart failure, and very brittle uh, blood pressure controls are the detrimental factors for the maturation. Uh, the hypercoagal state should be ruled out uh, by the history of recurrent abortions or failed fistulas or failed transplant, because if these factors are not been corrected, the subsequent fistula is going to be very challenging. In modifiable factors, the obesity is an important uh, risk factor because the vein will be buried uh, in the fat of pad. So even if the fistula is matured, we will not able to puncture it uh, or cannulate it even with the help of ultrasonography. So obesity is one of the important modifiable risk factors. Uh, uh, surgeon's experience is again very important and the surgeon sitting in this podium will agree that we need to do certain amounts of fistulas to overcome the learning curve and to, uh, to have a stable results in our, uh, in our fistulas. Previous cannulations are very important and hospitals should have policy that the normal veins of the CKD patient should not be injured while taking uh, blood samples or IV cannulations and they should be preserved for future fistula formation. Uh, smoking uh, history is again very important. Early cannulation is again an important point uh, because if we cannulate the fistula prematurely, then again, there's a chance that we may create stenosis in these patients. So uh, if we see uh, the trend of cannulation in all those countries, the Japan where we have, uh, where, where there is a fistula first approach, they usually cannulate the fistula in less than one month. Uh, otherwise, all the, all the countries, all the major countries, they do cannulation within one to two months. Again, uh, in US, uh, there is a trend to do cannulation after three months. It is very important to understand the dynamics of fistula and how the uh, fistula matures. So the feeding artery has uh, enough pressure and the volume of blood that it can uh, 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 sufficiently supply the draining veins, three to four draining veins sufficiently. Uh, after uh, fistula formation, the low pressure vein is exposed to very high pressure, violent atmosphere of the artery. Uh, the almost 75% of the blood draining to, uh, uh, to the fistula is supplied by the feeding artery. After fistula, again, there's a trend to have a retrograde flow from the distal artery and which supplies 25% of the blood to the fistula. That means the distal artery will steal some blood from the uh, distal limb, uh, but it is, uh, it is usually physiological and uh, it is not going to cause any problem. So as I mentioned, there is a violent uh, force over the artery. Artery has to face, uh, face a, a remodeling process and ultimately it will mature in the form of arterialization. So, uh, so very important uh, uh, to have a 
uh, maturation and if, uh, if we uh, want to understand uh, modeling, then there are two types of modeling. One is outward modeling. As Dr. Muthu Sir has mentioned, after a fistula creation, uh, there are a few changes uh, which uh, matures the vein. One of them is endothelial uh, secretions of NO, which, which is a muscle, which is a vasodilator, and it will allow the artery and vein to dilate and accommodate more blood. The secretion of MMP by endothelial cells uh, will allow decomposition of elastic layer from the media. And again, it will help to di dilate the vein. There will be eccentric hypertrophy of the smooth muscles of the medial layer. And again, it will help to dilate the vein. So by all these procedures, by all these biochemical uh, cascades of events, ultimately the vein will be prepared for the fistula formation. But while this outward remodeling is going on, we have one more opposite uh, uh, mechanism going on, which is called as inward remodeling. Uh, and this in re inward remodeling will cause thickening of intima. It will cause thickening of intima. It uh, decreases the luminal uh, size. It will slow down the blood and ultimately it can cause stenosis and thrombosis. This intimal thickening is known as venous neointimal hyperplasia. And for that, uh, three things uh, come into picture. They team up with each other and causes this neointimal hyperplasia. One is the turbulent blood flow. Other is the inflammation. This inflammation can be because of surgery, because of uremia, because of oxidative stress. And because of this inflammation, the pro-inflammatory macrophage and lymphocytes will uh, just accumulate in the intima. Uh, plus, they will also invite the smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts to be in the intima. Uh, and ultimately, they will cause uh, neo-intimal hyperplasia, stenosis, and subsequent failure. And thus, uh, uh, thus uh, early failure or fail to mature or pseudo maturation, they all are same and is generally defined as inability to cannulate, uh, say, after one to four months. Uh, usually, it is said that after four months, uh, uh, there is no further point in waiting because after six weeks, uh, it is not going to it is not going to uh, dilate or uh, become uh, functional. So uh, the, though the exact definition is under, uh, under debate, almost 50% of the fistula could not be used uh, after three months. And most uh, common cause for that uh, is a poor uh, arterial lumen. So thus, if the outward remodeling is prevalent, uh, then the fistula will uh, mature successfully. But if the inward remodeling is prevalent, then this fistula will surely stenosed and got thrombosed. So as I have mentioned, uh, stenosis is the main culprit, main Achilles heel of the fistula, and the juxta anastomotic uh, stenosis is uh, around 70% because this is the area where the vein gets, gets the maximum brunt. Other common area of stenosis is more proximal when the veins are there, when the valve, vein, venous valves are there, or when the vein has been uh, cannulated at the time of uh, fistula. The less common sites are arteriovenous anastomosis and the venous and the uh, arterial artery de novo uh, stenosis. All those uh, reasons are for stenosis. Uh, so whenever we do a uh, surgery, uh, we uh, and if we suspect that there is a venous stenosis, we always uh, pass an infant feeding tube. Uh, as we see, uh, first we dissect the vein before dissecting the artery. Uh, we handle the vessels uh, with our hands only and do less instrumentation as possible. We pass a five or six uh, French infant feeding tube to almost uh, uh, 25 to 30 centimeters to confirm that there is no uh, venous stenosis. Uh, and if you find some, like if there's a surprisingly, we find that there's a stenosis, as Dr. Muthu has mentioned, we just uh, ligate the vein, we abandon the vein, we explain to the patient and the relatives, and if given a chance, we go to the other hand or more proximally, but we make sure that patient goes with the functioning fistula because as uh, we, we discussed, uh, the maturation will take a few months so it is always good to send the patient with the functioning fistula. Any surprises should be corrected. And if needed, uh, we can change our location also. Uh, other complication is thrombosis, which is the most frequent com uh, complication. And it is a consequence of stenosis only. Now, this thrombosis we can get immediately. Like if we are forming a fistula and we find that now there is no thrill and there is a thrombus at the anastomotic site, what should we do? We should we immediately uh, uh, re-explore the fistula, we should remove the thrombus, and we have to refresh it. 
because most of the time it is a technical error. So if required, we should refresh once or twice and to our surprise, uh, we can get functioning fistula after our uh, due efforts. Uh, early thrombosis is common when it happens after say one uh, day uh, after the fistula formation and before the maturation, before we cannulate the fistula. And it is mainly because of a medical cause, uh, which can be either a fluid depletion during dialysis or the cardiac failure. So all those medical conditions should be corrected or should be under check to prevent a fistula failure because fistula is a lifeline for the patient. Late, late uh, thrombosis. If a patient comes with a thrombosis lately, it is mostly because of stenosis and they are very difficult to treat. Uh, so typically this patient came to us after a few months uh, of a fistula. Uh, usually we ask patient to check their thrill uh, routinely uh, to see the functionality of the fistula. So he came to us with history of uh, absent thrill since the morning. Uh, this is a very precious fistula because we can see it is a basilic vein transposition. There is a medial incision over the medial aspect. And we can also see there are uh, puncture marks over the fistula and probably is the reason for uh, stenosis. So uh, though we know that uh, oral outcome is not good, but because it is a precious fistula, we have to explore the fistula and the same thing we did. Uh, here again, good thing to notice is uh, we handle the vessels with the with the loops and not with the clamps whenever possible. Other thing is uh, we can see there is a complete arterialization of the uh, vein. Uh, the vein has become almost same as the artery. The lumen is almost same as the artery. So uh, we uh, explored the patient, we opened the anastomosis. Ideally one should express the clot uh, with the hand. And after that, one should pass a phogartic catheter from distal to proximal side. We have to clear the vein uh, and see a good outcoming flow from the vein. And if needed, uh, if the, we can find the stenosis nearby, we can either do end-to-end -end anastomosis or uh, we can just put a patch or interposition graft. Now, this thing can also be dealt with interventional radiology by doing intraluminal thrombectomy, by doing venography. And if you find any uh, any narrowing or stenosis, we can always correct it with the help of balloon angioplasty. The role of antiplatelets uh, and anticoagulants are uh, really questionable uh, in, in, in many studies. Uh, and, uh, uh, and in contrary, they sometimes cause a lot of bleeding when we try to use them uh, to help them in our uh, fistula maturation. So now we have newer and newer devices which help us to prevent this new intimal hyperplasia as well as stenosis. Uh, in this mechanical device, uh, it can be external device, which is known as VASQ. The siliconized uh, braid is there, uh, which will uh, overlap the artery and vein, and it is supposed to cause uh, less uh, wall shear stress and reduce the stenosis. We can also have uh, uh, the also the internal device has also been explained, in which the device is uh, inserted in the vein, and it is supposed to decrease uh, the neointimal hyperplasia. Uh, newer targeted therapy, which is a, which are the drug eluting uh, scaffolds, uh, which delivers the NIH suppressing agents directly to the site of anastomosis, uh, uh, which uh, which delivers serolimus, patitexels, uh, and drugs like that, which prevents the NIH and uh, increase the longevity of the fistula. Uh, so we have discussed stenosis and thrombosis as a fistula uh, maturation culprits. We have a uh, few more to come. Uh, other thing is hemorrhage. After fistula, if patient gets a hematoma, it will compress the fistula and ultimately it can cause thrombosis. Uh, after fistula, uh, having a leak or having a generalized ooze is very common because we know that CKD patient has a uh, altered coagulation profile, uh, the altered platelet uh, aggregation. Uh, so few, uh, so some oozing after fistula is very common. Usually after the change of one or two dressing, they become dry the other day. Uh, but if the uh, bleeding is, uh, say, significant, it may be from the technical fault, it may be from the anastomotic leak. At that time, we have to just open up a big and take one or two sutures to just stop the bleeding. If the bleeding is late, say, after, uh, say after uh, uh, dialysis, uh, it is because of heparin we use during the dialysis, and uh, it can be easily controlled with a good pressure. Uh, but if the bleeding is torrential, say from the aneurysm or something, uh, it warrants urgent surgical exploration and ligation of fistula. 
Uh, other complication of fistula is the aneurysm, which can be a true aneurysm, which contains all the walls of uh, veins. Uh, though again, uh, at what diameter one should define a fistula is not very clear, but uh, most of the literature agrees that if the dilatation is more than say three times, then the remaining of the fistula is called true aneurysm. The incidence is from 43 to 60 percentage. As the fistula gets older, uh, people used to have uh, uh, true, true aneurysms. Uh, though it is uh, being unsightly, uh, 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 but it doesn't have any major complications, and there are very, very low risk of rupture on those uh, true fistulas. Uh, true fistulas. Uh, but if sometimes these true fistulas uh, becomes aggressively uh, increasing in size, or if they get infected, then it uh, warrants uh, exploration and ligation of fistula. Now, uh, the pseudo, pseudo aneurysm is a, is a real trouble uh, because it is not actually aneurysm. Uh, it is just a blood clot. So what happens after a, uh, after a dialysis, uh, the blood continues to trickle from the dilated vein and it got collected uh, in the form of pseudo aneurysm, uh, which, which will be easily diagnosed with the help of uh, Doppler ultrasonography. Sometimes this fistula get infected and then they become a live bomb. They can explode anytime. Uh, the incidence of pseudoaneurysm is nearly 2% with AV fistulas and 10% with AV graft. Uh, now, treatment here is to immediately explore the patient. We have to just de-shave de the uh, uh, aneurysm and overseen oversee with the, oversee the defect. We can uh, also uh, cut that segment of the vein and do end-to-end -end anastomosis, and we can put an interposition graft. Uh, now, with the advances in interventional radiology, we can treat them with the help of uh, interventional radiology also. If the defect is very small, uh, we can just inject a thrombin locally and close that defect. But the, if the defect is large, then we can put a cover stand uh, to combat the pseudoaneurysm. Uh, one should understand that while we are dealing with all those exploration, uh, the condition should be very, very much optimum. Uh, patient should be under general anesthesia because under local anesthesia, uh, the patient will be restless, uh, seeing a lot of blood, seeing uh, the stress of the surgeon, and then and, and, and of course there is a lot of pain while during the fistula. We should have a tourniquet proximally as well as distally. Uh, and here we can see uh, 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 in addition to the proximal tourniquet, we also have a distal tourniquet in the form of a polycatheter. There should be adequate uh, illumination, adequate instrumentation, and adequate staff because most of the time we are doing this surgery at midnight or on the odd hours. So, uh, so if you don't prepare a uh, properly, then it, it is going to be a nightmare for the surgeon. Uh, other complication is a ischemia to the limb, though it is a very uh, less frequent complication, but they, they do occur and they are, they are relatively serious. Uh, those ischemias can occur uh, commonly with the brachial arteries, when the brachial artery is involved in diabetic patients, female gender, when they are more than 60 years, when they do have their uh, cardiovascular diseases, when they smoke, and when uh, there are multiple uh, failed fistulas in the same arm, then there are high chance that those patients may have uh, ischemia. So as we have uh, explained previously, mentioned previously, uh, feeding artery will give 75% uh, of the supply to the fistula, and the distal artery will give uh, 25% uh, supply to the fistula. But when this uh, ratio reverses, when uh, the distal artery gives more blood than the feeding artery, then the still becomes uh, significant, which till now was just physiological. And this thing occurs when there is a critical narrowing at the artery. So when there's a critical narrowing of the artery, the feeding artery cannot supply the fistula adequately. Then this brunt has to take on has to take uh, have to take by the feeding artery, and this will cause a still to the distal arteries, and ultimately it can lead to the fistula. Thus, uh, uh, the still uh, phenomenon when it is associated with the hand ischemia, it is called DAS or dialysis as uh, dialysis access associated still syndrome. And at that time, uh, during the dialysis or exercise, 
patient will have a symptoms of ischemia. There will be cold hand or there will be pain in the hand. Uh, there will be altered or diminished sensation over the hand. The peripheral pulses will be absent. The, the hand will be cold and there will be a muscle cramps or atrophy and there may be a loss of tissue. Even the amputation has also been explained in the literature. Um, uh, like critical uh, arterial narrowing, patient can have a critical venous narrowing also, as Dr. Abhijit has mentioned, and it can lead to a venous stenosis, venous stasis, and uh, edema of the arm. And because of venous stasis, patient may develop ulceration, uh, ulceration and ischemia. And for this also, uh, interventional radiology in the form of angioplasty is the first choice of treatment. Uh, more severe form of ischemia, though again very uh, very rare, is a ischemic monomelic neuropathy. Uh, so what happens when we occlude the brachial artery during the fistula that we do uh, for the proximal uh, proximal fistulas? At that time, the nutrient vessels which supplies only nerves get injured. And even after the successful fistula, we open up the clamp of brachial artery. Uh, this nutrient artery, because they don't have a good uh, watershed zone, they don't have a good collaterals, got affected, and uh, these nerves get permanently injured. Uh, the, all the three important nerves, either one, two, or all the three nerves can get injured. And if the, all three nerves get injured, patient may have a claw hand like uh, deformity. Uh, unlike still syndrome, these symptoms occurs immediately. Usually we find those symptoms in the recovery room. The pain patient will have a severe hand pain uh, with numbness and, and, and there will be paralysis and uh, motor and sensory deficit we can find. But unlike uh, still syndrome, the hand will be warm. It, it won't be cold and uh, Doppler confirms uh, the distal pulsations, distal flow also. This is a very critical condition uh, because even if uh, we diagnose this condition early, we treat it, we re-explore and we ligate the fistula early, there are high chance that patient may have a residual paralysis, residual pain, as well as sensory and motor, uh, motor or residual issues will be always be there. So this condition uh, should be thought of, should be avoided and should be treated as soon as possible to avoid devastating complications. The main difference between DAS and uh, uh, monomalic neuropathy is uh, digital pulsation. The hand would be cold in case of DAS, whereas uh, the later case, it will be normal or uh, uh, absolutely normal. The last complication uh, I want to discuss is the infection. Uh, though it is, again, not a very common uh, form of uh, complication, uh, the incidence being 0.5 to 1.5% per patient per year, and it is mostly because of Streph aureus. We know the uremic patients are immunocompromised patients. Uh, there, uh, there is a reduction in the chemotactic, phagocytic, and bactericidal activities of neutrophils. And uh, there is a defect in T and B cell mediated immune response also. So they are prone to infection and sepsis. When the patient presents like this, it warrants uh, urgent admission, IV antibiotics, urgent debridement, uh, and uh, patient should be hospitalized till the conditions get settled. If you find that, you no, know, it is also sloughing the wall of vessels, it is better to ligate uh, those fistula. Um, uh, otherwise, there is a high chance of torrential bleeding, secondary bleeding from this fistula. So uh, this type of infection uh, must be taken care very seriously to avoid torrential bleeding and life-threatening complication. The treatment is IV antibiotics, irrigation, debridement, et cetera. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Uh, I also thank all the all the viewers uh, who are uh, who are uh, patiently listening us, uh, and thank you very much for attending this class. Uh, I have a question uh, with Dr. Patil. Dr. Patil, when uh, you are doing a fistula, and after fistula, you find that now there is no thrill. Uh, like uh, what? What exactly you do? Like uh, what is your uh, way of uh, of next step? So, <clears throat> intraoperatively, if uh, I've done my announcements, I've released my clamp, and if there is no thrill, now there could be three problems. Either there could be an inflow problem, there could be an outflow problem, or there could be a systemic problem. Now, the systemic problem would be is that I would like to see the blood pressure of the patient. 
and whether I have I ruled out the outflow stenosis in this patient. These are the systemic factors that I need to see. I, I need to see the inflow. So if my vein is collapsed, if my vein is collapsed, then there is some inflow problem. What I'll do is uh, I'll do a small venotomy, just uh, perianastomotic. And uh, uh, if there is no blood when I do this venotomy, that means there is a clot or there is some anastomotic problem uh, in my uh, in my technique. So what I'll do is I'll put a Fogarty's uh, catheter proximally and distally, and uh, I would like to remove some clot if there is so. And uh, if there is uh, some difficulty in my uh, 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 catheter to go inside, that means I have taken some wall, a uh, posterior wall at some point of time. So if I am satisfied with my inflow, then I would look for my outflow. Again, uh, free hand, I would have checked uh, whether the outflow is very well, but I still would put a small IFT uh, to push some saline in it. And if now the blood comes out very well from this small venatomy, and then I close this venatomy so that the fill is good. So basically, inflow problems have to be looked after and sorted out. Outflow problem, outflow has to be checked. And the most important is the systemic factors. You cannot have blood pressures of 80s and 90s and you struggling with your fistulas and why there is no fill in the fistula. Okay, thank you. Uh, my next question is for, for Dr. Kunur. Uh, Dr. Abhijit, uh, what you do for the exhausted fistula? Like uh, sometimes we do multiple fistulas and ultimately we tell them that, uh, sorry, uh, doctors, we don't have uh, further access for fistula or graft to form. So what are your options when uh, there's an exhaust uh, fistula site? So what do you do at that time? Dr. Abhijit, please. Okay, then question for Dr. Muthu. Uh, sir, uh, if the patient comes with a torrential bleeding, like you get a phone call that now patient has come with torrential bleeding uh, uh, in the emergency room, like uh, how will you manage those patients who came with a torrential bleed from the fistula site? Well, uh, Dr. GK, there is one of the toughest situation where uh, actually uh, that's what I, my last slide in my talk that um, you have to inform the patient if there is any bleeding, he has to compress it immediately. And, and if he comes to emergency and the, the emergency physician, whoever that, they have to apply a tonicate and immediately the patient has to be wheeled into the ward and, and, and it needs to be explored. And um, saving life is more important than the saving history. Can I add a point to this, sir? Yeah, sure. So, um, what we also tell our patient is that if their fistula bleeds at your home, what you can do is the cap of the lid of any bottle, what you can do is you can invert it, apply at your point where it is bleeding, and tightly wrap a cloth so that the patient reaches the hospital and then we can apply to a new thing. Thank you, gentlemen, for, for being here today and sharing your knowledge. It's life-saving work that you do, and thank you for that. Patients around the world makes a world of difference to them. I want to once again thank you for joining us, and on behalf of Dr. Bondari, the CEO of the Vatikuti Foundation, thank you, and we will have more programs in the webinar series that will be announced on our website and our social media.